The rally was magnificent because of the range of struggles that were represented there. And this is indeed, as Jan said, the substance of Marxism. But getting to that substance and making sense of what's involved and its potential can sometimes involve a very tortuous route. And that's what I'm talking about uh, today. It's in September, it will be 150 years, of, years since Capital, a critique of political economy, book one, was published in Germany uh, by a then not very well-known author called Karl Marx. Now, Capital, volume one, is an intellectual masterpiece. It's the pinnacle of Marx's whole a theoretical ach achievement. Uh, in his correspondence with Engels, he talks about the book being an artistic whole. It, what that means is he took an enormous effort with the composition of the book to make it as accessible as possible. Now, you know, I think Jan dropped a copy of it and it landed with a thud on the floor because it's a thousand pages long. So, you know, it's um, a very substantial piece of work and famously, it's a hard book to start. Uh, the, the first part of the book on commodities and money is hard to get through. But nevertheless, it's a book that is work worth persisting with. Joseph Chinara has written uh, an introduction to Capital that's just appeared that can be helpful if you're trying to read Capital Volume 1, um, or indeed the other volumes of, of, of Capital. It's it's definitely worth doing, reading volume one of Capital. I, what I want to do is to try and situate that work in Marx's, Marx's career, to bring out um, what was involved in the work and why it's so significant. Now, it was the product of a very long period of intellectual struggle on Marx's part. Already in the mid-1840s, when he's a young man, only beginning to develop his view of the world, he plans to write a critique of politics and political economy. So he's already engaging with political economy. Political economy is the 19th century name for what we now call economics. It was a lot better, political economy, because it was the work of intellectual giants like uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo. But nevertheless, Marx it's not something I'm going to talk about much, was very conscious of the limitations of political economy and the, ne the necessity of criticizing political economy from a communist, what we would today call a revolutionary socialist standpoint. Now, these researches are interrupted by a minor episode called the revolutions of 1848, upheavals that sweep across Europe that Marx is heavily involved in but which unfortunately are defeated. And in 1850, Marx moves to London, he is, uh, where he spends the rest of his life as a revolutionary exile. There he returns to his economic studies. Uh, in the early 1850s, he writes a massive series of notebooks uh, that both reflect the research he's doing, but begin to sketch out um, a mature theory. But then that, that research is interrupted until 1857. What happens in 1857? Something that we're not familiar with, a global financial crisis. Actually one that started in the United States, just like the one in 2007, um, but that spreads to the rest of the world. And this Marx says in his correspondence with his great collaborator Engels, Frederick Engels, prompts him to resume his economic struggle uh, studies. And he engages in the most intensive research. He's working on two books, really. One is a empir popular empirical study of the crisis uh, that will present, from Marx's perspective, an overview of what's happening. Uh, he never, like so many things, he never completes this. But the um, materials for this so-called book of the crisis have just been published. Um, it's now publicly uh, available. The other thing that Marx does work on is a massive theoretical manuscript known generally as the Grundrisse, 
the foundations of a critique of political economy in which he first really uh, begins to hammer out his mature theoretical system. But people sometimes say Marx was a dogmatist. In other words, he just said, this is what I think. You've got to, it's absolutely right, you've got to believe it. This is not true at all. Marx was the most self-critical of thinkers. He was never satisfied with anything that he wrote. He was constantly revising what he wrote. So he wrote the Grundrisse, and on the basis of that, he produced what he hoped would be, he actually published what would be, he thought, the first part of his critique of political economy, which, is, which actually was, appears in German, in uh, 1859 and is called a contribution to the critique of political economy. Uh, it fell completely flat. No one took any notice of it and Marx was very disappointed by that. So he worked to complete the contribution because it, it, the contribution is a small, uh, is a hundred, 150 pages and Marx, it was the beginning of a much larger work. And he produces this absolutely enormous manuscript, which is called, very informatively, the 1861-63 manuscript, because that's when he wrote it. And this is the real laboratory where he re refines and consolidates his, his analysis. But, so he finishes it, uh, and Engels, who's constantly prompting him to get it published, thinks, okay, now we're in the final straight. No, no, no. There's another manuscript, um, parts of which are only, no, uh, which, which was only eventually published, I think, in the uh, 1980s, called again very informatively the 19, the 1863-65 manuscript. And it's only after that that Marx finally writes Capital, Volume One, and it appears, um, as I said, in September 1867. So. Capital is the product of a very long process of research, theoretical elaboration, and self-criticism and revision. Um, I, I, it's capital uh, book one or volume one. So it's part of a three-volume work. First volume, the first volume is devoted to the capitalist process of production. The second volume, um, devoted to the capitalist process of circulation, and volume three, the culmination of the work, um, deals with the unity of the process of production and circulation. So that's the formal subject matter of the, the book. But to, in order to understand what Marx is doing, we have to remind ourselves of what the title of the book is. Capital, that's Marx's object. By capital, he means what we now call the capitalist economic system. And Marx has a very distinctive understanding of capital. Um, a couple of years ago, a French economist called Piketty uh, published a, a book called Capital, slightly vaingloriously, uh, implicitly comparing uh, his book to Marx's. In uh, my home, Piketty's book is quite thick, and we use it as a doorstop. <laughs> um, um, Piketty, but Piketty has a very conventional meaning of capital, which he means wealth, money, assets of different kinds. That isn't how Marx understands capital. For Marx, capital is a social relationship. And it's a social relationship critically between two groups of people, the capitalists who control the means of production in society and the workers whom the capitalists exploit. Capital therefore, isn't simply for Marx a relationship, it's a relationship of exploitation and class struggle. And once we see that, it's what the book's about, we begin to see the connection between talking about Marx's capital and the kind of struggles that we saw at the rally, rally last, last night. Now, why volume one of Capital is so important is it's there that Marx develops his theory of capitalist exploitation. He explains how exploitation is distinctive and indeed uh, definitive of capitalism as an economic system. He does this in an odd way, and this is what trips people up so much. So if you read, if you start Capital, get through the prefaces and so on and so forth, then you get part one, um, it's called Commodities and Money.
And the first chapter of that, on the commodity, is the most intimidating of all. And this is where people often stop. That's why it's not a bad idea uh, to skip the first part of Capital. You should read Joseph or uh, Marx's own epitome of his theory of value, uh, value, price and profit. Um, then, you know, start on part two where things begin to, for reasons I'm going to explain, become clearer. Read the rest of the book, which is much more accessible, and return to part one at the very end. That would be my suggestion. Any, uh, some people think it's a really bad idea because you have to start with Hegel and that kind of thing, but never mind. Anyway, uh, why does Marx start with a commodity? This wasn't uh, his initial starting point. In the Grundrisse, he starts by looking at money. Why does he start with a commodity? That's because, the most, for him, the most abstract way of understanding capitalism is as a system of what he calls generalized commodity production. What does that mean? Capitalism is distinctive in that most of the goods and services, what he, like Smith and Ricardo, would call use values, that are produced in a capitalist society are produced as commodities. That is to be, to be uh, they're produced in order to be sold on the market. They're produced for sale. That's the distinctive thing about commodities. But what underlies generalized commodity production is a situation in which um, production is carried out by a set of autonomous and interdependent producers. Autonomous and interdependent. What does that mean? Autonomous. Each unit of production, let's say, although it's a bit early in the argument for that, each capitalist firm is independent of the others. It's an independent center of decision making. The capitalist who controls the unit of production decides what's going to be produced in what's, what proportions and so on, independently of all the other capitalist producers. But they're interdependent in the sense that they depend upon each other for the commodities that they need in order to produce. A firm, let's say, a car producing firm needs raw materials, it needs rubber, it needs steel, it needs glass, etc. It buys that from other capitalist firms. They're interdependent also in the sense that typically, under generalized commodity production, in any given sector, there are a number of different units of production, all producing the same, same commodities. They're competing with each other in order to gain a market. The understanding this is crucial to understanding what Marx calls the law of value. This is the idea that he takes actually mainly from David Ricardo, the greatest of the bourgeois political economists, who argued that a commodities exchange in proportion to the socially necessary labor time required to produce them. That um, the, the fluctuations in the prices of commodities fundamentally reflect the amount of labor that is required to produce different commodities. This is the labor theory of value, although Marx usually calls it the law, the law of value. Why does the law of value operate in a system of generalized commodity, commodity production? Crucially, because of this, the fact that it's production driven by autonomous and interdependent producers. The producers compete with each other. Uh, they co compete with each other, and in the process of competing with each other, the successful firms are those that have the lowest costs of production, where the decisive cost of production is the labor involved in producing the co commodities concerned. And what this through the comp competition between different terms, a certain norm of efficiency is imposed on the sector. If you produce less efficiently than that norm, if you take more labor to produce commodities than the norm of efficiency prevailing in your, 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 your sector, then you will be at a competitive disadvantage. And ultimately, you'll be driven out of, driven out of, out of business. This, Marx sometimes describes as different forms of concrete labor being reduced to units of abstract labor. In other words, for a firm to su compete successfully, the labor that is performed, the productive activity that is performed in that firm, is 
isn't just treated as labor in its own right, what Marx called concrete labor, the labor, the actual time spent producing a particular kind of commodity, using particular tools of production, and so on and so forth. Rather, it's compared with labor performed in all the other units of, units of production. And it's, it's that practice of comparison isn't an intellectual process, it's the result of competition. And the effect is to reduce all the different forms of concrete labor to units of abstract social labor, units of socially necessary labor time. Okay, that's the, this is the hardest part of the, the argument, but it's um, how Marx shows why the labor theory of value operates under capitalism. It's because of the fragmented structure of production and the competition between different producers, each um, deploying labor to try and outcompete their rifles. Okay, that's essentially what Marx does in part one of Capital Volume One. He also shows how money necessarily arises from this process of commodity exchange, but although that's really important, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, I've tortured you enough as it is. <laughs> but part one on the commodities and money, money is inadequate in, in one crucial respect in understanding capitalism. Capitalism, Marx points out, is very distinctive in the following sense. Um, there's a famous formula that Marx uses for what he calls simple commodity exchange. This is when, this is the formula CMC. If I were clever, I'd have PowerPoint and would show you that, but I'm not, go I, I'm not clever enough to use PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> So the, the basic formula of simple commodity circulation is CMC. C equals a commodity which is sold in exchange for money, M, and then the M is used to buy another commodity. Now, on that basic kind of commodity circulation, the point of bringing a commodity on the market is to get another commodity. You know, I, you know I'm a producer of shoes, and I'd like some, some meat. Sorry, this is very simplistic, but you get, get the point. So I sell some shoes, get money, and buy, buy some meat. So the orientation of production on this CMC formula is use value, consumption. But that's not what happens under capitalism. The formula for exchange under capitalism is MCM prime. M, an amount of money that the capitalist has, that the capitalist invests. The capitalist, in the crucial instance that Marx is looking at, uses that M in order to produce commodities, or to get, as we'll see, his workers to produce commodities. And then he sells those commodities for more money. So it's MCM. But Marx says it has to be MCM prime. What does the prime mean? The prime means that at the end of the process, there's more money than there was at the beginning. Now, Marx says, how the hell does that happen? How can you, you know, come along with a certain amount of money, invest it, produce commodities, and then when you sell them, you end up with more money? Is it because the capitalists are cheats? They're ch cheating each other and so on. And Marx says, of course they're cheating each other. That's essential to their nature. But the cheating will cancel itself out if we're talking about the capitalist class as a whole. So where does, where does the extra M come from? The surplus value, as Marx calls it. Answer, it comes from one thing that Marx hadn't made explicit in part one. In a system of generalized commodity production, it's not just goods and services that are, are generally commodities that are produced in order to, to be sold. Labor power is a commodity. The ability to work is a commodity. On the basis of capitalism are workers who've been separated from the means of production. At the end of the book, in part eight, Marx shows the process of primitive accumulation through pe which peasants are deprived of the land and reduced to wage laborers. At the basis of capitalism are a mass of wage laborers who have no alternative but to sell their labor power uh, in, in exchange for a, for a wage. Now, this is crucial because labor power isn't just any old commodity. Labor power is the commodity whose use value, in other words, 
uh, whose usefulness, when it's, when it's used, sorry, using the same word a bit often, is labor. And if the law of value is valid, it's labor that creates value. So what the workers are selling is the ability to create value. And all the capitalist has to do has, is to get the workers to work longer than is necessary for them to replace their wage in the form of new value. Just get the workers to work longer than that, and the capitalists get surplus value. And that surplus value is where the additional money in the MCM prime formula comes from. That's where the capitalist profits come from. This is the crucial argument in Capital, capital volume, volume 1. This is the basis of Marx's theory of surplus value. And thanks to that, Marx is therefore able to show um, in the rest of Capital Volume 1 how capitalism as a system, um, how the capitalist process of production is organized to extract surplus value from the workers. And he does that in tremendous detail. And I'm going to talk about one example of that um, a, bit, a bit later on. It's very, 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 very rich. Um, for example, the whole analysis of the Industrial Reserve Army, the way in which technical change on capitalism generates unemployment that provides uh, workers that can be used to exploit the workers and so, so, so on and so forth. Um, but because capitalism is a system of generalized commodity production, you can't just look at the process of production. Commodities and through them capital circulate on the market. The capitalist only makes his money when he sells his commodities on the market. And there are all sorts of implications to that, which Marx explores in Capital Volume 2. And then, in Capital Volume 3, he looks at the unity of production and circulation, the whole complex operation of the, the system. One way of thinking about it is that in Volume 1, Marx studies the production of surplus value, an American Marxist, Fred Mosley, has suggested in volume two, he looks at the circulation of surplus value, and then in volume three, he looks in particular at how it's distributed within the capitalist class itself, divided between industrial capitalists, commercial capitalists, money capitalists, land lords, all sorts of uh, thieves, robbers, and, and, and parasites. Now, this structure makes sense, but Marx never finished capital. He left behind the manuscripts, in some cases quite chaotic, of volume one and two, and it was Engels who edited them into, into volume, volume three. How much, how much longer have I got? You've got ten. Ten minutes, okay, good, I hope. Um, yup. Um, now, some commentators say the fact he didn't finish Capital is a sign that he ran out of steam, a sign of intellectual impasse. There's a new in lots of ways quite bad biography of Marx by Gareth Stedman Jones, which argues this. There was a pretty ropey uh, biography of Engels a few years ago by Tristram Hunt, that, you remember, very brave Blairite MP who ran all the way to the Victoria and Albert yeah, to collect his money, um, who also said that Engels ended up, uh, sorry, that Marx ended up in a state of intellectual impasse. This is, uh, this is nonsense. Um, Marx was working particularly on volume, capital volume two because of some quite niggly problems that he was trying to work up on, um, work out until quite close to his death in the early, early 80, 1880s. And he spent a lot of time trying to update his study of, in particular, finance in volume three by looking at the development of finance in the United States, which already in the 1870s he could see was going to be the new center of global capitalism. The problem was, fundamentally, Marx was a perfectionist. He was never satisfied with his own work, um, and so he constantly revised it. He never stopped trying to, trying to revise it. And poor Engels ended up um, really carrying the can by um, pulling the manuscripts together and get, got a, thoroughly criticized for it. But I also want to say something finally about the political context in which Marx wrote Capital Volume 1. Because often people write about 
even Marxists write about the Marx writing capital like it was this self-contained intellectual process in which Marx sits in his study and wrestles intellectually with Hegel and Ricardo and God knows whoever. This is completely wrong. To begin with, Marx was what you might call an independent scholar. In other words, he didn't have a salary. He wasn't a professor or anything like that. He survived, with, often with great difficulty, thanks to the financial support of Engels. But he was... So that makes his work distinctive. This isn't a product of the academy. Secondly, Marx writes the first volume of Capital. He concludes this whole process, as it turns out, produces the published culmination of this this, this process as the leader of the International Working Men's Association, the first international formed in uh, 1864, involving an alliance of all the varieties of French socialism and British trade unionists, but with Marx as the key link sustaining the whole thing. And this wasn't just, you know, he didn't just come to committee meetings and say, I agree, and things like that. He led the first international through a series of major campaigns. First of all, campaign of solidarity with the North in the American Civil War, supporting the North in the destruction of the slave system in the United States. Very important to remember, anyone who says Marx didn't care about racism, read what he says about the necessity of the destruction of the slave power and about how the working class in the United States is uh, fatally weakened by its dependence upon the enslavement of, of black, black labor. This is, was a very important issue in Britain. Uh, the slave plantations of the South produced the raw material, cotton, for uh, British textile industry, the driver of the Industrial Revolution. There was a cotton famine. Uh, huge numbers of workers were laid off, yet the trade unions campaigned in support of the North. Marx was part of that struggle. Number one. Number two, in the late 1860s, solidarity, trying to win the British trade unions to see the importance of supporting the struggle of the Irish people for national independence, which for Marx was a key issue in uniting the working class in Britain, because the downtrodden, racially persecuted migrant laborers of the 19th century were the Irish in Britain. In Britain. And finally, you have the, 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 the Paris Commune of 1871, uprising of French, French workers, brutally crushed by the, the French state. Marx conducts, a, on the one hand, a campaign of unflinching solidarity with the Commune that leads to his persecution by the press and the, you know, the equivalents of the tabloids and so on. And he also wages an ideological struggle against the anarchist wing of the international led by Mikhail Bakunin. This is the context in which he writes Capital Volume 1. He writes it as an active political, political militant. And you can see this, uh, for example, in the fact that after, he, after the defeat of the Commune, he, one of the ma his main priorities is to get capital translated into French. And he works very hard supervising the translation of the French edition, uh, which is, you know, uh, now seen as a version of capital in its own right because of the changes he m makes in it. Why did he do that? Because Paris then, as in the 20th century, was the capital of the European left. You'd had this huge workers' struggle. Marx wanted to reach those workers. Doesn't really feel like he was embarrassed by you know, the intellectual problems with his work if he was trying to popularize it to the single most militant section of the, the European working class. But he was also engaging in the book in an ideological struggle on the left. In France, again, so important, the dominant socialist influence was a man called Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who was a kind of reformist who thought the market was fine uh, if you stripped away the kind of corruptions produced by high finance and monopoly and, and so on. And Marx, uh, there's an interesting new book on capital by a Canadian scholar called uh, Roberts, uh, William Clare Roberts, which shows the extent to which in Capital Volume 1, Marx is conducting a political argument with people like Proudhon. 
the, pr the argument for his theory of surplus value proves that a pure capitalist economy will rest on the exploitation of the worker. It's not, exploitation isn't products of the imperfections of the market. But you see this reflected in the book itself. In the book itself, one of the most remarkable uh, parts, and it's the thing that struck me most when I first read it, is chapter 10 on the working day. It's an incredibly powerful part of the book. Anyone who thinks it's just an academic work, work read, read chapter 10 and how he describes the sufferings inflicted on the British working class by greedy employers extending the working day longer and longer, wearing people down, in, virtually enslaving them to, to labour. But he also describes not just the sufferings of the workers, but their resistance and the development in particular of a movement that forces the introduction of um, restrictions on the, on the, on the, on the, work, on the working day. So even some Marxists say there's no class struggle in capital. You can't say that if you've read uh, chapter 10 on the working day. The whole book is full of the class struggle, but it's so visible in that chapter. It's fascinating. You, oh, okay. Well, I'm still going to say what I was going to say, uh, but uh, before I move to, to winding up, which is that Marx didn't plan to round, write chapter 10. There's this letter to Engels where he says, I'm not feeling very well, so I can't do the tough theoretical work. So I'm doing this, this chapter on the working, working day. It's empirical, so it's, so it's relatively easy. So he, you know, tosses this thing off, you know, when he's feeling under the weather. Uh, it's an, it just, it, it makes you, you know, really... Oh, Full of full of awe that he could he could he could do that, um, but it reflects the importance of the the class struggle to the work. So, in conclusion, you can look at Marx's capital at at, th at three levels. First of all, you can look at it, and I'm not going to talk about it. I've talked about it at uh, torture, tortuous and torturing length in deciphering capital. Um, Marx develops a very specific method of analysis, which he draws on Hegel and goes beyond Hegel, that is very much worth learning from, but as I say, I'm not going to talk about that now. Secondly, it's a work of strenuous empirical research. I've mentioned the chapter on the working day, but there's a, um, uh, his discussions of the role of technology and technological revolutions in capitalism is tremendous and builds on much greater research that he'd done particularly when writing the 1861-63 manuscript, but it's also and fundamentally a work of critique. It is a critique of capitalism as an economic system. He calls it the critique of political economy, but he's criticizing political economy because political economy systematizes in different ways the everyday ideological representations of capitalism, the way it's presented as natural, the way it's repre represented as uh, being based on freedom and so on and so forth. So Marx is attacking how capitalism represents itself in its most sophisticated forms as a means of criticizing and understanding capitalism as a system it's itself. So it's not just a work of detached scholarship, disinterested scholarship, it's a work of critique and it's a work of combat because the critique isn't itself from an abstract point of view, the critique is taken from the standpoint of the working class. It's taken from the standpoint of those workers who, despite the fact that they lost their jobs, campaigned in solidarity with the North in the American Civil War. It's written in solidarity with the efforts of the Chartists, of trade union activists, to winning a shortening of the, of the, of the working day. It's written from a, the perspective of, of a working class that Marx sees not a, as victims, but as the agents of change of their own emancipation, as he wrote in the founding documents of the, the, f the first international. So Mar Capital, Volume 1, is a great scientific treatise. It belongs aside, alongside the works of Galileo, of Newton, of Darwin, and Einstein. But it's also an instrument of revolutionary struggle and self-emancipation. Um, 
Uh, the first uh, argument we're faced with is that Marx is out of date. And what I want to say is simply this, that precisely because Marx was writing at the, really at the birth of capital, there was a shock of the new. So therefore, he could, seeing the changes around him, he could cast a really sharp light on workers' experiences. And I sometimes think that we should have a, a, a problem page in socialist work, uh, call it Dear Carl, and pe pe people could write, write in with replies. And so my problem is, I work shifts. I never see my partner. This is an experience of people's daily life. So um, Marx replies in his uh, column, Dear Carl, he, he, sa he says this. The other thing we should say, he writes absolutely beautifully. This is everyday language. So he replies in, in, in reply to the reader's problem about the shift system. He says that while machinery lies fallow, to quote, they represent a useless advance of capital. The prolongation of the working day beyond the limits of the natural day only acts as a palliative. It only slightly um, quenches the vampire thirst for the living blood of labor. Capitalist production, therefore, drives by its inherent nature towards the appropriation of labour throughout the whole of the tw 24 hours in the working day. I hope you feel better, dear reader, for understanding it. Well done, thank you. The young man here, and then I've seen... I would encourage some women to put their hands up too, please. Uh, well done. Yeah, but if you can... The man who had his hand up, do you want to come up? Young man, come to the... Sorry, I don't know your name. Young man, you are a young man. Uh, it was just a, a question for Alex Klinikos. Um, if you could come back to political economy and tell us a little bit more about the historical conditions in which it came about, the 19th century intellectual movement and what the ideology of political economy is. OK, thank you. Yes, and then the man who had his hand up... Sorry. If, yeah, it's just if people could come up, then it just kind of saves time waiting for you and watching you uh, walk to the front. Uh, I, I have a question for Alex Klinikos, and I have to construct it very carefully because I'm running with the theme of science fiction, the future, because I, I, I need him to predict. As a student, I, I, uh, I'm very lazy. I just use the index. I, I tend not to go in the deeper uh, end of things. but But... This is how it is, right, in a way, because there isn't going to be a, a lecture on imperialism this year. It's going to be on Trump and the uh, crisis of the neoliberal order. In a way, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to ask a question about stages of capitalism, or as Marx would see it, but then uh, Luxembourg carried it on further in the sense that if Alex is right and he says that Marx's system is about many capitals competing against each other, as well as the exploitation of the workers, if that's the case, then imperialism is the last stage at all of capitalism, but the latest stage. And therefore, it is about what we could see as a uh, re repeat of the First World War, where there's slaughter and blood, or as Luxembourg would put it, um, socialism or barbarism, right? However, this is where I would like to ask the question, and the question is to do with the fact that what if we don't have what it's called the final slaughter house or the slaughtering, or maybe we we could arrive there, but we have what is called a world government, whereby the exploitation of the workers is, in, a, in, in essence, realized through a new form of slavery. In, I, and, and here I'm referring not just to 1984 or um, Brave New World, but a Russian novel called We by... Yevgeny Zamyatin, in which the notion of the ruling of the capitalists, the 1% or less than 1%, succeed in telling all of this that we are part of this mind thing and we're in it together 
and basically, um, basically they tell us what to do, and they rule. They they make sure it's all controlled. Would this be the end of capitalism as we know it, or as some interpretations and definitions of capitalism would be, or is it the case that we were still at that point where the um, many different types of capitals are struggling with each other still? I I'd like uh, to. Okay, thank you for that question. Other questions like that, I'm sure, will be very welcome. Uh, the comrade, yes, and other hands, if I can see other hands. Well, look, confession, I didn't get past chapter one, like Alex said, so I might try another chapter. But uh, as for uh, capital, I think I've read lots of commentaries on it and Joseph's book and stuff. But uh, I think the main thing for me was that for me, like Karl Marx was a caricature, you know, uh, something I used to see in comedy programs, like Wolfie Smith showing my age and things. And it was something on the wall like uh, Che Guevara. And uh, my, coming from what I did in the council state, we didn't, there was not many people I knew who were students. And there's always a kind of um, antipathy between students and working class kids like myself. And I remember it was uh, back in the 70s when I used to go to football matches and stuff, and the NF were recruiting outside the football grounds. And I'd got into like being a skinhead and uh, Scar music, it was a kind of contradiction there. I couldn't understand why the NF recruiting some skinheads were racist and at the same time they really loved the uh, black music and stuff. So I was a bit confused, couldn't quite understand the contradiction there. And uh, so anyway, uh, <coughs> I remember my, uh, my partner at the time, she was a school teacher and she basically um, set me on the road and gave me this book on sociology and uh, it was like organic stuff, all these kind of theories which didn't make much sense to me, didn't sort of relate my life. But um, what Marx gave me, I think, was like, looking back on it now, I sort of think of it like a mirror. And when you have a mirror, it uh, gives you it's a, a, a view of the world. And it's still the world, but it's all cracked. It's all fragmented. So it's still real, but there's bits here and a bit there and a bit there. And I remember thinking about it, it was like, that's how I saw work. You know, politics was like parliament, economics was that work, was this. It was all separated out. What Marx did was he joined it all together and made it into a kind of a whole picture, so you can make sense. So I remember I was made unemployed during a recession in the 70s, and I was quite bitter because I couldn't get any work. So, and yet I knew there were some skilled workers in the factories who were doing overtime and stuff, and I couldn't quite understand it. I thought, what's going on here? So, uh, and I, so I, started, I started asking questions, and basically Marx sort of like made sense of the world for me, which was a great relief because you tend to blame yourself. It's the way capitalism works. It's, you individualize the things, it's you, you're not capable, you, you're not intelligent enough, you're not skilled enough. And lots of working class kids go through that. So it's a shame that Marx had became so kind of academic, ac academicized and just stuck. To, we had where I used to live, like Warwick University. Oh, like, sorry, yeah. But to cut a long story short, um, the main thing that struck me was when I read this and like, bam, it was like uh, he said that uh, it's not social consciousness that determines your being, but it's that your being that determines your social consciousness. And to me, that was the key, you know, that's what explained everything. Thank you, Conway. The man here, you've got your hand up, please. And then I'm going to ask Joseph at the front. You need to go to the mic, sorry, unless you're a school teacher. Right. I'm trying to formulate a question for Alex in terms of the the contrast or the comparison between capitalism in the 19th century and today's capital. It seems that Marx was quite enthusiastic about capitalism in the 19th century because capitalism in those days really made stuff. And the early 19th century was a rate of enormous technological advance. I don't think people today have really looked into this, uh, realized that the enormous difference in technology between, say, 1805 and 1840. Uh, if anything, it tended to slow down towards the end of the 19th century. So Marx is quite enthusiastic about um, capitalism's productive potential because then the capitalists seemed to be really investing in stuff. They were building factories, they were promoting trade, they were doing all sorts of positive stuff on the ground. But now we seem to have degenerated into a form of hollowed out capitalism, where actually people think we live in a great age of technological advance because we've got a lovely iPhone which has beautiful technology. But all that technology was developed decades ago 
by and funded entirely by the state, both in here and in the US. So in, in other words, it's drawing to a close. And capitalism, I think, is far more an empty shell, but nonetheless, it does enable the dominance of a certain class. It's just a matter of extracting wealth rather than producing it. And I think we've really got to blow this wide open. Another thing we've got to blow open is the idea that inventors need a whole bung enormous amounts of money in order to invent stuff. And that wasn't really how it happened. I mean, and it doesn't today, because think of how many IP rights are actually owned by the people who originally invented them. But I, IP rights become a commodity like property. And I think what we're getting today is a vastly more rentier capitalism where people are not doing anything and I think we need to smash this open. Uh, there needs to be a massive uh, re redistribution of wealth in favour of people who are actually doing stuff, creating stuff. So I see Alex is nodding off to sleep as I'm doing yeah. <laughs> Get up, Alex, Come on, Alex. Uh, respond to the comparative. Right. You didn't say anything about the comparison between then and now. All right. Thank you, comrade. Uh, point well made. Joseph and then the lady behind. Woman, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So, someone asked about um, political economy. I'm, I'm a very big fan of a book by Isaac Rubin called The History of Economic Thought, which is a fantastic guide to the social and economic conditions in which political econ classical political economy emerged. It's freely available on the internet, and I, I strongly recommend it. Um, but I want to say a little bit, bit about that, because um, one of the points that Marx makes in Capital is the reason why Smith and Ricardo... Uh, are greater than, than their successors, what he calls vulgar political economy, is that Smith and Ricardo are forced to grapple with the system in its expanding form as it begins to conquer the globe. And they have to have some sense of how the system works. At the same time, Marx says there are limitations to this. The limitation is not Smith and Ricardo are stupid. The limitation is inherent in the nature of capitalism. And there's a whole section at the end of the first chapter where he talks about what he calls the fetishism of commodities, reification, and so on, where he talks about the surface appearance of capitalism as a system of commodity exchange systematically obscures the real social relations of production. You can, get, you can go into a shop and buy a commodity with no sense of the underlying web of social relations that actually went into the collective labor that produced that commodity. Everything about, about production is what Marx calls somewhere the hidden abode of capital, capitalist production. It's hidden beneath the surface. And Marx says that this, this uh, misleading surface appearance places limits on what pl classical political economy could achieve. One of the implications of that, it, it, it raises the question, how is Marx able to go beyond this? And Marx is able to go on beyond this precisely because his standpoint is a standpoint of workers. And it comes across in very general ways and very, very, deep, uh, very concrete ways. The general ways is a standpoint in capital, is a standpoint of, a, of an exploited and powerful class. Uh, systematically, he views things from the perspective of workers as a group of people who are the source of all wealth in capitalism, but because of that acquire a power to, to, to challenge capitalism. But it comes through in much more prosaic ways as well. The chapter on the working day that Alex mentioned has a fantastic passage where Marx makes a theoretical point about the need to uh, not destroy labour power, that, that, that workers want to be able to reproduce their labour power. How does he sustain the argument? He quotes from a manifesto of construction with building workers in London in the 1860s, where, he talk, where they talk about their struggle and Marx paraphrases it. How did he know about their struggle? He reported on their struggle as a revolutionary journalist. You can tell when you read into Capital that Marx is writing as a, as a revolutionary from a revolutionary uh, standpoint. And just to finish, one of the things that happened in the opening rally yesterday is one of the workers talked about an attempt to thieve from the workers 15 minutes of break time. These are precisely the processes that Marx talks about. It gives it a, rele a relevance and a resonance for working class people today. And for all that's happened in the in interceding 150 years, working class people can read, understand, and familiarize themselves with capital precisely because we live under a capitalist system that remains exploitive and oppressive today. Thank you, Joseph. The man in the... Oh, sorry. The lady... The woman, sorry. And you'll be next. I want to ask Alex about um, artificial intelligence. And we're told that uh, capitalist enterprise will need far 
fewer actual people to do the work. Mm. It's going to be done by robots. And what relevance does that have for Marx's theory of value? Okay, good question. Be the man here, and then, was it, yeah? Lady, yeah, just to respond to the comrade that was asking about Zem Zemyatin's we, uh, the, the idea that, you know, there might be a, a possibility for capitalism of sort of like a world slavery system. And that, that is the theme of Zamyatin's We, and, and, and that was then a book that was very influential apparently on George Orwell's 1984. That kind of view, you know, this is the future. I consider myself very lucky to have been in a meeting once where Tony Cliff was asked about George Orwell's 1984, and Cliff's answer was, ah yes, the television screens. What happens when the television screen breaks down? Who has to fix it? This is the power that we have, comrade. We have the power of the workers. And that's it. I mean, that, you know, that is at the center of Marx's capital. You know, what's, what was the answer to 1984? It was 1989. We overthrew it. You know, and the working class was absolutely crucial to that. And I think this is the heart of Marxism, that we actually make everything and we keep things running. And that is our fantastic social power. It's the great secret that the Daily Mail and all the rest of them don't want us to know. It's at the heart of capital and therefore we have to know it inside out. Um, and then, you, that's the man there. Yeah, we'll do. Hi. Um, I wondered if you could, Alex, say something about competition and how capitalists always argue that it's only through competition, uh, i.e. the capitalist system, that we can have progress and advancement as a species. Um, so if we don't have it, will the human species just cease to progress positively? And how do we counteract that argument? Okay, thank you. Man. Accessibility and stimulus of, of Marx's empirical writing on the working day. Trying to campaign in the rural southwest, I've found, I think it's in volume two, his historical deep research into the early modern period, detailing the brutality with which wealth was accumulated by means of appropriation, is absolutely gripping for rural workers and for other people who are living in that rural area. They could see it happening. The appropriation, the, the enclosures are still going on now. And when they read the detailed brutality of what was done to set the capitalist system going, they are changed. And they are more willing to engage in political action. It's, it's not the industrial working class, but it is the oppressed classes who need to be woken up, and that's what Marx can give us. I think it's volume two, uh, but th that history that he researched in detail in the British Library, worth looking at. Now, I just say, we have got enough time for another couple of contributions. I mean, there's nothing worse than leaving a meeting saying, God, I wish I'd made that point, or I would wish I'd asked that question. So, please, while this person is speaking, if you want to put your hand up. It's last chance. Right. I, I have a question about uh, David Harvey, um, who's certainly introducing a lot of people to uh, Capital through his companion series and uh, the videos that he's published uh, with lectures that he's done. And I think he's introducing uh, many others, initiating many others to, uh, to Marx's ideas to, uh, to Capital. And I'm, I'm working through with a group of people. I'm about halfway um, through this. And I just wonder if there's anything I should uh, be asking myself while I'm uh, watching uh, David Harvey present uh, his, his take on, on capital. I, uh, you know, by and large, it's great. It's to be celebrated that so many people are, are, are reading capital. But I wonder about some of his approaches. I can just think of two ideas uh, on the get-go. He talks about accumulation through uh, dispossession, uh, for example. And it just seems to me that he's conflating two different things there uh, and, it's, and it's not a concept that I'm familiar with through stuff that I've read uh, you know in our tradition um, and then one other uh, particular question I have uh, you know Alex you just you said capital refers to uh, a relationship or a set of relationships and and Harvey emphasizes that it's, it's about a process is, is that an important distinction um, 
and, uh, and I guess in general, there's some questions I should be asking myself when I'm uh, watching David Harvey's um, uh, otherwise like, super useful uh, videos. Thank you. Thank you. The lady there, mentor. It's 150 years since this work was published, and um, I'm not an intellectual myself. I, I don't keep up with the academic trends in what can be described as academic life, but there doesn't seem to me anything that's been developed since then that comes close mm. to explaining the modern world we're in. And so I think that we have a real task in modernizing Marxism for the 21st century. I think that's actually a theme of today's Marxism. And Alex finished off mentioning the question of agency of change. Because to me, Marxism, because of its scientific detail and complexities, gives an argument as to where the agency of change is located in our society. And put very simply, it's the working class. Now, there's many people who would, might describe themselves as Marxists or former Marxists, people we work with, people we have worked with, who would accept Marx as an intellectual giant, but actually reject the idea that what he has pinpointed and pointed to is that the working class of the world is the agency of change. I believe firmly it is, and therefore a lot of the intellectual and practical arguments we have is actually showing to people why that still is the case, that everything else is a substitute, if what you actually want to do is tear down the roots of capitalism. Okay. Which we do. The young man here, and then the young man there. And those will be the last two. Yes, I'm one of the many who have stocked in uh, Capital Volume 1. But actually, the reason why I, I put my finger up was um, a recommendation because um, the thing about uh, how commodities um, kind of hides the social relations um, and, and, and the exploitation is um, there's a solution to this, I think. Um, there's a documentary called Can Dreams, which is on Al Jazeera, that shows how, how many social relations that's behind a can of avioli, you know? Uh, the Italian pasta dish with meats in and stuff like this. So you see all the people, different people who works in Brazil, in Denmark, in Poland and France to produce this can of ravioli. So, and each person you, f you follow in the different workplace, they interview some someone who, who tells about their desires, their hopes, their, um, their lives. So you actually kind of get a, f a face onto the many different social rela relations that's uh, part of, 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 of this uh, production of this uh, can of raviolo. So it's just, it's free, it's on Al Jazeera, and it's very good for using for education and, and stuff like that if you want to talk about uh, economy. So it's just a recommendation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi comrades. Um, I only have two quick things to say. Firstly, I'm going to ask like Alex to reaffirm my belief that Ayn Rand's uh, Atlas Shrugged is a masterpiece of true trash. <laughs> and then secondly, I wanted to ask what, how would you respond to the like idea that um, value is actually value and prices are actually based on like subjective desires rather than actual labor okay thank you I'm gonna ask Alex to come back but just to say thank you for all of the contributions I mean this is the beginning of Marxism it's your contributions that make these meetings so please if you haven't spoke or you're nervous about speaking think about doing it in the uh, rest of the meetings that you're attending so thank you and now Alex will okay um, over. Um. right thanks a lot lots of good points first of all David Harvey David Harvey has made an enormous contribution 
Um, not simply to make uh, capital more accessible through his video lectures and his books, his commentaries on capital, but he's also made an enormous contribution to deepening our understanding of capitalism. His book, The Limits to Capital, published I think in 1982, is a modern classic. It's a really valuable work. So I'm greatly in, in awe of Harvey and what he's um, been able to achieve and quick plug. I'm involved in a conference uh, that he'll be speaking at for the 150th anniversary of Marx's Capital that will take place actually here in Yulu, uh, whatever it now calls itself, um, uh, in, in September. So I think, I, think, I think Harvey's a really important figure. And I think one reason why he's such a popular figure is because um, what he does is to talk about Marx and capitalism. And the reason why someone said, you know, no one has matched Marx's, the systematic character of Marx's work. But critically, that's true, but that's critically because, you know, if you want to understand capitalism, you have to go to Marx. No one else is going to tell you about capitalism in the kind of depth and range that Marx does. And since we live in the grip of capitalism, that, you know, we go back to Marx. And Harvey is an enormously helpful guide uh, to Marx and through, through capitalism. Is he always right? No, no. I mean, the thing about capital being a process as well as a relation, I think that's absolutely fine. You know, it's, tr it's true. Marx, in particular in volume two, introduces the concept of the different circuits of capital, money capital, productive capital, and so on. And Harvey develops this in a very original way. Is he, is he always right? No, no. Uh, and if you really must, you can look either at um, my discussion of some of the things he's written in Deciphering Capital. There's also an article that Joseph and I have written um, criticizing Harvey's rejection of, Marx, of Marx's theory of the falling rate of profit. So he's not always right, but his contribution, it's, one's disagreements are vastly outweighed by his positive contribution. Point one. Point two, AI. I'm a skeptic about a AI. Because I think that at the core of the labor theory of value is the way in which what Marx in his early writings calls human creative activity is um, driving capitalism. And it's human creative activity. The ability of human beings to come up with new ideas, new combinations, new ways of doing things. Now, I haven't followed the research into, into AI in any depth, but my impression what AI does is use the, the, um, the facilities of, of computers hugely to speed up certain processes, often very highly repetitive processes, that can be of some complexity if we look at guided, guided cars and so on and so forth. There's no doubt that capitalists will use different kinds of robots more in production as a way, a way of cu cutting costs. Can this replace human creative activity as the driving factor in any system of production, no, I believe it can't. I'm not saying it can never happen, but it doesn't seem to me that we're remotely close to that happening. Okay, some other points, quickly, quickly now. What else was I going to, going to t talk about? Um, someone talked about how, capital, how Marx offers a sense of capitalism as a totality admit, amid the fragmentation that we experience in capitalist society. Now, this is a theme in Marx himself. Marx argues that capitalism operates in a way that represents itself as fragmented because we tend to see capitalism through the framework of circulation of the, of the market and the exchange of products on the market. The subjective theory of value, which is the core of mainstream economics, is essentially a generalization of of um, how we experience the fluctuation of commodities in the market, where it can seem um, that these commodities are fluctuating in response to the desires of individ individual human beings. This is a view of capitalism which is induced by the way in which it, 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 op it operates. Um, but what Marx does is indeed, as the comrade said, to give us a sense of capitalism as a totality, but crucially, a totality rooted in production. The hidden abode 
that Marx calls it, as Joseph, Joseph said, that generates and underlies all the superficial patterns of capitalism, where, which we indeed experience in a very fragmented, fragmented way. Uh, the question about uh, capitalism creating a world, a world government. Incidentally, there was a talk on Marxism in, uh, and imperialism, but unfortunately it was in the previous, previous session. Um, capitalism is indeed a system driven by competition. Um, as Marx puts it in the Grundrisse, capital necessarily ex exists as many capitals. In other words, these are autonomous but interdependent producers that depend upon each other but compete with each other. That's what drives capitalism. Is it possible that that fragmentation could be overcome? This is an idea that a number of Marxists have had. Karl Kautsky with the idea of ultra-imperialism at the time of the First World War, which slightly contradicted his claim. Uh, more re recently, Michael Hart and Tony Negri in their book, book Empire. In my view, it hasn't happened. Uh, we still live in a profoundly fragmented and competitive capitalist world. Look at the G20. <laughs> you know, these bastards getting together in, 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 Ham, in Hamburg. What's the dominant issue there? That they're at each other's throats. You know, they all hate Trump. Trump maybe loves uh, Putin a little. Maybe he's trying to get, get friendlier with the Chinese. This is nothing to do with personal relationships. This is to do with the antagonisms that divide the different capitalist classes. Someone also asked something about competition as the source of, source of innovation. I think, of course, this is something that capitalists tell us. We only get innovation because of the competitive drive of, of the system. But as someone pointed out, many bourgeois economists are worried that, um, that, that there isn't enough in innovation, that innovation is running out. It's controversial whether this is true or not, but certainly w what is true is that in the advanced capitalist countries, there's less productive investment going on. This um, th this is an indi indication of the, the limits of capitalism's capacity to generate technological pro progress. The, main, the most important innovations that have taken place have essentially been driven by curiosity or even, even more vulgar motives. I mean, where does the internet come from? It comes from the US, uh, the Pentagon, trying to devise a way in which its different bases could communicate in the event of nuclear war. Um, you know, nothing to do with profit or any, anything like that. And we know the web comes from the work of disinterested scholars and scientists trying to communicate with each other. So there's no evidence for the idea that competition is necessary. Final point, final point um, on whether, how different is capitalism from, from Marx's, Marx's day. Of course, in many ways, it's different. But it's different primarily in the sense that it's realized his vision. I mean, Chris Fuller talked about Marx and the shock of the new, this sense of this globalizing productive system erupting on the world and transforming it. This has gone much further since Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto, or Marx wrote Capital. We have the in the incorporation of the global south in the full dynamic of capitalism as an industrial system. And if we look at capitalism from a global point of view, it's not true that the productive cap potential of capital has run out because we see, you know, productive investment is low in countries like Britain because the rate of profit is very low. If we look at China, that's, we don't see investment running out or production ceasing, ceasing to operate. So capitalism isn't a par parasitic system. In many ways, while there are differences with Marx's time, on the whole, the world more clearly approximates the kind of abstract structure that he outlines in, in Capital, and that's why it's such a, a living work. He both grasps the fundamental structure of capitalism, but he also sees how it's dependent on and fundamentally threatened by the constant, the endless struggle between exploiter and exploited, between capitalist and worker. And it's on that struggle that the future of capitalism or the end of capitalism depends, and it's because of the continuation of that struggle that Marx is so relevant today. <laughs>